Wow. Yeah, I'm ready to go home. I'm just ready to, <laughs> ready to pray and go home. But this is why we gather really is to uh, study God's Word, to hear it, hear it opened and read and to explore it. Uh, we're coming up, my wife and I, on our 15th anniversary in May of this year, 15 years. We got a while. Yeah. Amen. It's cool. I'm excited. It, it, May 19th, uh, but here's the deal. When we got married, someone had bought us a waffle maker, which uh, we were excited about. I, I love waffles, and uh, I remember when we came home from our honeymoon and plugged that thing in, we were ready to make waffles. We had made the batter, and we were ready to make waffles, and that waffle maker didn't work. <laughs> it was broken. And we were let, we, what do you do with a waffle batter that you can't use? So we just kind of... I think made pancakes or who knows what, right? Yeah. And, uh, and for about, I don't know, 12 years of our marriage, we just didn't have waffles in our marriage. <laughs> it was sad. But we kept it. I remember looking into the graveyard. You know, we all have that graveyard of kitchen things that you buy it. And you think, man, I'm going to use this every Sunday or every day because the commercial said I would and you never use it. And so I remember I'd put stuff into that, you know, abyss of the, the kitchen and I'd see that old waffle maker. We never threw it away. You know, you don't throw away the gifts, you know. And finally, Christmas, about four years ago, three years ago, I, I wake up on Christmas morning, I'm opening up a gift, and my wife bought me a new waffle maker. <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> and we had us some waffles. And every day of the week, we'd have a waffle day with the kids, and, and Jenny would grill up some waffles. And, you know, it, I hadn't really been accustomed to waffles. Many of you may be aware of this, and as I'm getting older, I remember I ate and devoured waffles for breakfast one day, just had them doused in the syrup, and man, it was so good. I went about my day, but something happened at about 11 a.m. Some of you know where I may be going. I had a sugar crash unlike anything I had ever experienced. My hands started shaking, and I was thinking, am I dying? What is this? You know, and, and it was, I had not had any protein with the waffles. And how many of you, am I only alone in that? Do I need to see a doctor or am I, all of you? Okay. I'm just making sure I'm not the only one here. Um, but I, I remember every time she makes waffles now, I'm like, I need something with protein. I need peanut butter or I need something with meat. Make me some bacon, honey, you know, something. Amen. All right. Everything's better with bacon. I got to have protein. It is a necessity of life that we eat the right food and that we balance our diets well or else there, there's going to be some side effects and trouble. For the Christian, according to the words of Jesus from this text we're looking at, it is of absolute necessity that we take in the word of God. Because he says in this passage, as he is being tempted by the devil, he says it in verse 4, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. We don't struggle with food usually. I mean, we, we eat good. We're Baptists. You know, Baptists are, our Baptist bird is the fried chicken, you know. So we, we do pretty well. As we gather, usually we gather with food. If there's going to be something going on, and this afternoon, by the way, after the service, come on over for a reception for Ben as we gather over there and we'll have some nice dessert. Let me set the context of this. This is written by Matthew. Matthew was a disciple of Jesus. He was the tax collector. He was the one that Jesus came to him at his tax booth and says, follow me. And Matthew left his booth to follow Jesus. He left all that he had and, and followed Christ. He was hated by his fellow Jews because he exploited them for financial gain. And yet Christ found him and called him to follow him. And I love that story about Matthew. You may feel like people might hate you. And Christ is holding his hand out to you saying, follow me. And he loves you deeply and has proven that by his death on the cross. As Matthew writes the temptation of Jesus, if you compare the temptation of Jesus to how Luke presents the temptation, Luke puts it in a theological order where it shows up right after this long genealogy. Have you ever read that genealogy in Luke? Luke goes old school. He goes all the way back from Jesus all the way to Adam. You know, Matthew goes all the way to Abraham. Luke goes all the way to the first man, Adam. And, and he does his backwards. His genealogy in Luke, it, it starts with Jesus and Mary and Joseph, and then it works all the way backwards, all the way down to Adam. And then right after you, you read the word Adam, you get into the temptation of Jesus. I've always wondered, why did Luke do that? Why did he write the genealogy and then put the temptation right there? And it's for a reason. I believe the reason is Luke wants us to be mindful that as we read the temptation of Jesus, 
we have Adam in our minds. You remember Adam was tempted by the devil? And things didn't end so well. We're in this mess today of, in sin. We're all inheriting the sin of Adam, all of us from birth. He was tempted and he gave in to that temptation. Him and Eve both gave in. And so as Luke writes this story and gives us Adam right there, he shows us immediately what Paul writes as the second Adam. Everywhere that Adam failed, Jesus did not. And so Jesus was tempted by the devil and every point where he was tempted, he held firm and true and quoted scripture. And so we see that in Matthew, he's doing it chronologically. In Matthew, we have the calling of Jesus, of course, into ministry, the baptism of Jesus, and immediately after the baptism, it says he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And here we are, we see him fasting 40 days and 40 nights. And yeah, he was hungry. And then the tempter, the devil, approached him and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. You know, the devil knew who Jesus was. Sadly, the devil has greater theology and knowledge of Christ than many Christians. He, he, he knows that Christ was God the Son. He knows all about Jesus and knows the Word. And instead of cave in, of course, Jesus answers in verse 4, he quotes Deuteronomy. And he says, it is written, devil, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes and proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus understood immediately the necessity of Scripture. He understood man's need for revelation from God, for God's voice to speak into our lives and guide. And so he is quoting from Deuteronomy here something that we all need to know well. All of us need to be aware of how deeply we need God's Word and how deeply we need God to speak into our lives and to give direction and instruction for us, which His Word does. I want to speak today about the necessity of Scripture. I want to speak about this as a doctrine, the doctrine of the necessity of Scripture. And if you have your notes with you, I want to give the definition there. The definition comes clearly from Wayne Grudem. It's just a simple definition. And he writes there and says, the necessity of Scripture means that the Bible is necessary for knowing the gospel, for maintaining spiritual life, and for knowing God's will, but is not necessary for knowing that God exists or for knowing something about God's character and moral laws. We can actually know that according to the Bible. It says that that's written on our hearts. That's clearly understood as we go about our lives. We know in our conscience uh, that something is a sin. The Romans tells us that the law of God has been written on the tablet of our hearts. And while we learn of God and learn of his laws, it is definitely necessary to study the Bible to know the gospel, to maintain a spiritual life and to know God's will. And so you and I need the Word of God. We need God's Word. Desperately, we need it. And there are times in life where you go through a hurricane of events. Maybe you lose a, a loved one. Maybe you go through a transition of some type. Maybe there's a health scare. And, and all of us are in the same boat on this. We get into that, that hurricane of mess, and we're in turmoil. We're not sleeping right. We're worried. We're staying up all night and then as we pray and open God's word and seek God's word, God speaks into our situation. And just like Christ calmed the storms, he calms the storm. And we're ready. We're like, God has spoken. I, I know what I must do now. I have a calm from God and an inner peace guiding me through this turmoil, this mess. And there's nothing like it. You know, when God speaks into a situation, we respond afterwards with this bring it on mentality. It's like, bring it on. I'm ready for it. But until that moment comes, we're an absolute wreck, all of us. We depend and need on God. We, we need God's word to speak. Do you know that God's word created us? The very word of God created us. God has such creative capacity and, and such power. He can speak the world and did speak this world into existence just through words. Can you imagine that kind of power to just say orca whale and there it is? I mean, that's God. That is the creative power of God. It explains to us in Genesis, he spoke this world into existence from nothing. There's this phrase, I, I don't need to go into it, but it's, it literally means from nothing. God spoke this world into existence. And it's his word that sustains us. It's his word that gives us faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Christ in John 1 was the word made flesh and dwelt among us. Everything in our lives really is bent towards our need for God and his word. His word made us. His word sustains us. His word saves us. 
We are dependent on the word of God for very, our very lives. It's his word that makes us consist and hold together. And how often are we rushing through life without ever seeking what he would command? How quickly do we get out of our houses and we're on I-4 or whatever awful road it may be in Orlando and we're making our way to wherever God has placed us in life and we have no clue, we haven't dialed in to whatever his word commands for us. All of us, we, we all struggle with this. So as we understand the necessity that we need the Bible, there are three things I want to go through. And they're very simply found here in the text. The first thing is you need to familiarize yourself with it. If you're going to uh, understand God's word and, and take that into your life, you need to become familiar with the Bible. And I've written the book that you can have today for that purpose. Uh, I've gone over in this church this sort of a spoken overview of the Bible. I've provided in there on page 13 a visual overview. I, I'm kind of excited about that because as a nerd, I spent three days pouring everything into it. And it's there, though, to kind of give you a good overview of the entire Bible on one sheet of paper. I wish I had had that in seminary. I didn't really grasp the big picture of how the Bible is one grand story until even after seminary. And finally, when I understood that God's Word is all one major story, not thousands of, of disassociated, separated stories from one another, it's one major story. And, and we're in that story as the church. We're in it. The Bible begins with where the world began, and it ends in eternity. It ends where we're all going. We're in it. We're in the story. But the story's not about us. It's all about Jesus Christ. And so I don't want us as a church to get off track and think the Bible's always about us. It's, it's never about us. It's about him, but it, it does include us, okay? So I guess it's not that it's never. It, it does include us. We have a role in God's grand plan, but it's all for the glory of God and all for Jesus Christ. And we have to familiarize ourselves with it. Jesus was familiar. Every time the devil tempted him, He's not coming up with new things here. He's quoting the Old Testament. He's quoting Scripture. He was familiar with Scripture. Even as a child, when he was 12 years old in the temple, he was confounding the scribes in the temple with his knowledge of the Bible. And we have so many amazing, wonderful tools to help us know what is being said in God's Word. For, for one thing, we have all the translations we have access to. And I would encourage you to get a good translation. I hope you have a translation you can read and understand well. There are two main camps in the translation camps on how to translate from the original Greek and Hebrew into our English language. You have those that believe in what's called the word-for-word -word approach, where they take a word from Greek or a word from Hebrew, and they find the closest English equivalent word, and they translate it somewhat woodenly but very exact into our language. And we love those translations. The, the most Popular translation in English history is the King James Version. That is a word-for-word -word translation from the original languages. Some of you love the English Standard Version. That's my favorite version, and it's a word-for-word -word translation. The New American Standard Version of the Bible, that's a word-for-word -word translation. Very exact translation. There are many of us in the room that love what I call the other camp, which is the thought-for-thought -thought camp. They would take an entire sentence in the original language and they would translate that sentence into its closest English equivalent sentence and translate a lot of what's there. And so many of us love these translations. That's your New International Version. That's the New Living Translation. These are thought-for-thought -thought translations. My encouragement to you, if you want to understand the Bible well, I would say buy a Bible from both camps. Get you a good word-for-word -word translation and a good thought-for-thought -thought and, and let them in stereo speak to you as you study the Word of God. Now, I have to ask this, though, because so many of us were raised on the King James. How many of you still study and read from the King James Version of the Bible? Could you show your hands? That is almost half of the room. That is amazing. What a powerful, strong translation the King James Version is. And I studied and read that as I grew up. I didn't really study the other translations until college, because that's the translation my home church used. Uh, now, I encourage you, though, King James is word for word. I would encourage you to supplement your studies and buy one from the Thought for Thought camp, and you will find that it really assists you in your understanding of the Bible. Now, there's one translation that we use here, the Holman Christian Standard. You may want to know, well, what camp does that come from? It's the first Bible that ever endeavored to do both. And they literally had an editor over every verse say, now, what is the best way to convey the original of this verse into modern English? Should this verse use the word for word or the thought for thought? And so it may read a little bit disjointed, but as I've studied it over the last three years, the Omen Christian Standard is actually a very good translation. It's a very excellent translation. If you had to buy one, I would say it's the one to buy. It's a good one to buy. 
And so I'm just sharing that as I go through. Let me share another tool that I've used and love. I love study Bibles. And so I brought the top three study Bibles that I recommend to everyone with me here today. Uh, this is the English Standard Version Study Bible. This thing weighs at least 40 pounds. I'm kidding, but it's heavy. You can buy this online now for $25. If you go to Westminster Bookstore, it's online there for pretty cheap. This has over 20,000 study notes, where as you study the Bible, it's like having a scholar sitting next to you explaining what you're reading. It's a really good study Bible if you're seeking one. Uh, the other one that I really love is the MacArthur Study Bible. When I was ordained years ago at uh, First Baptist Jacksonville, they gave me a MacArthur Study Bible. And it was really helpful for me uh, going into seminary with that to really understand a lot of what's going on. Uh, this is one that I also love that many of you use, the Life Application Study Bible. Uh, it's a wonderful study Bible that really goes into grand detail on the people that we read about in Scripture. These are helpful. These really do help you understand the culture, some of the big words. And if you want to sort through and look at these, I'm going to have these up here on stage after the service. You can come up and thumb through them. Any of those three I'd recommend. But let me also say, I've never met a study Bible I didn't like. I love all study Bibles. And so if I have not mentioned yours today, don't think that I don't like it. All right? I love them all. I've just found these to be continually helpful as I've studied the Word of God. Are you familiarizing yourself with the Bible? And do you know how it all fits as one grand story of God's love for sinners through Jesus? And are you able, as the devil tempts you, to do as Jesus did and to quote Scripture into that temptation and to find strength against temptation? Let me just continue in that note. Number two, once you understand the necessity of Scripture, it helps you to, number two, fight against temptation. It helps you to fight against temptation. He was quoting Scripture, showing us he was familiar with Scripture, and he was fighting temptation as the devil was tempting him. And so something else I want to do for you is uh, there's in the book, I suggest some apps you might want to download to help you in your study of God's Word. There's an app I've used for years called Fighter Verses, and it's a really fun app that helps me to memorize the Bible and helps me to memorize Scripture. I want to share with you this morning a reason, one reason why I really love that app. It's an app you can buy for your phone or your tablet, and I have it on an Android phone this morning. And this week's verse to memorize is, uh, looks like Daniel chapter 2, 20 and 21. And something they do every time is they will actually take the verse and put it to music. I'll see if we can play it here. Can you all hear it? We're going to listen just for a minute. We having fun yet? It gets real wild here in a minute, but uh, <laughs> I'm telling you what, um, hearing those over and over as I'm driving, you, you find yourself singing them, and, it, and it's catchy, and you realize before long you know the verses. There are really good tools available to help us memorize Scripture, that as we memorize them, the Holy Spirit brings them into remembrance in time of need. It's kind of like a, a bank, you know, I, I encourage you that if you're able to do so, to save money away. So that if you get into times of struggle, uh, you're able to financially make it through because you've saved. As we memorize scripture, we're saving up God's word in our heart so that when we go through difficult times or times of temptation, we're able to draw from that account and quote. And I'm amazed how the Holy Spirit uses that. There are moments where verses I learned when I was a child, he will place into my mind just in the right moment of need. And it is the, the game changer for what I'm fighting. It is so cool. Uh, we have to be hiding his word in, just as Jesus did that. Uh, these songs can help a bit, and this app, uh, I think, has over five years' worth of memorization, where you memorize one verse a week, and you can even add your own verses. If you need help in fighting certain sins, something else I've found very easily is just to go to Google and to type in uh, verses for whatever it may be, 
If it's lust, verses for lust, Bible verses for lust, it will pull up tons of verses for you that you can memorize and study for whatever sin you're fighting. We see Jesus doing that as the devil tempts him. He is quoting scripture. We need to know scripture well and do as David said in Psalm 19, thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. Let's hide God's word in our heart and quote it in times of need. And then the, the thing we see in verse four especially, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Very simply, as you look in this verse, you understand, well, we need food daily. We need bread daily. If we don't have it, we're going to perish. We're not going to last long. We must feed on the word of God every single day. And so that's the third and final point today. Feed on God's word daily. We need the word of God just as strongly as we need food. And just as we would eat food every single day, and some of us quite often, we need to feed on God's word daily and often. We need it. We must train ourselves in the discipline of daily Bible study. Whenever anyone I know is facing hardship, one of the first questions I ask them is, are you staying in the Word of God? And I always concern, and am concerned when I hear no. I, I begin to pray for them, and in my mind I just jot that in because it's going to be a mess until they get a word from God. And I know that for my own self. I'm not high on the horse here. I can go through a problem and dwell on it day after day after day, and then finally, when I bring myself to, to study God's Word and, and really bring it before the Lord, I receive the help from Him I need. And, and I can be so stubborn, though, and, and so stubborn just to go on and say, well, I can make it on my own here. And boy, God humbles me so quick on that. It's like there's a humble button that He just pushes that. I want to encourage you, if you've never studied the Bible uh, or need a plan. We were going to start this year out with a whole Bible plan, and as the staff and I visited, and I visited with many of you, uh, we began to really get burdened to say, you know what, let's just do a 40-day study and really go over some of the tips of how to study the Bible well. And so the book assists with that. In the middle, again, is that 40-day plan through the book of Ephesians. Uh, if, once we get through that as a church, what I'd love to do is to do a 90-day overview plan of the whole Bible that will take us through the highlighted uh, chapters in the Bible that Tell us that main story in grand detail. And let me just conclude by just sharing this necessity. I'm amazed at modern technology and how in this very room, going around in this room, we have signals happening right now in our room from various sources. Right now in this room, we have TV signals bouncing around the walls. We have radio signals bouncing around the walls. We have uh, CB radio signals bouncing off the walls. All of us could pull out a cell phone and even though we have no wires at all, we could all be in 500 different conversations and it would not interrupt what's going on with the other phones in the room. I'm amazed at what is available to us in this room if we just had the right receiver to pick it up. If I had a radio up here on stage, I could tune in and we could listen to whatever we wanted to this morning. If I had, you name it, a TV, we could put it up on the big screen and, and watch the analysts talk about the Cowboys taking on the Packers. We could do it if we wanted, all right? God's voice is in this room and the receiver he's given you and me to tune in and to get from him the instruction we need desperately is his word. Are we using and tuning in well what he's handed us to tune into him? And are we in tune with the Lord where we know exactly that we're in the center of his will? Or are there questions about that? I want to encourage you as best I can to say go from this place today and get in tune with God. And the best place you can do that is in communion with him in prayer and studying his word. And let him speak to you. Let him guide you. Let him speak into your situations and watch the fruit that is born of love, joy, and peace as you commune with your creator as you leave this room. Let me pray over us now in Jesus' name. Father, I'm thankful for these that have gathered. I pray that your blessing would be on us as we endeavor to study your word. Father, we need it desperately. As Christ needed it, we need it. We take it in. Father, we want to be able to fight temptation. And we want to love your word as much as David did, who, Father, delighted in your law. I know for many of us it's a drudgery. It's hard to do. And I pray it would become our delight. And just ask God that as we open your word and commune with you, Father, we would grow into Christ's likeness. We would grow in our knowledge of the gospel. And we would see the gospel is not just necessary for us to become saved, but it's to strengthen us in our salvation. And we need to preach the gospel to ourselves daily and grow in our knowledge of it. 
Help us as a church to be obedient to Scripture. And Father, as we leave this place today, I pray for those who haven't opened their Bible at all, maybe since Christmas or New Year's Day. Holy Spirit, to work in their hearts and warm their hearts. Give them the grace to desire your word, that by it they may grow as mature Christians and bear fruit. And Father, for those that are facing struggles today, may they not neglect your word. May they open your word and find encouragement, support, and direction from you so that they can look at whatever trials they're in and say, bring it on, because you've given them strength from your word to fight the battle. Lord, I pray for the the men and women in this room that are succumbing to temptation. Father, for the man in this room that has stumbled and struggled with pornography this week, give him victory as he prays and seeks grace from you. Strengthen him from your word to fight this battle. And Father, give him victory in Christ that he could honor you in purity. And I pray also for those, Father, that are struggling with various other sins. Speak to them from your word. Lord, if there's a child here today, if there's anyone here today that needs Jesus, may your word speak to their hearts of their need for Christ. And may they leave here changed and converted because of trusting on Jesus. I pray this over our congregation today in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to end out today with an invitation for all today to come to know Jesus Christ. If you're here today and if you would say, I don't really know Jesus, I don't know if I were to die where I would spend eternity, we want you to know what the Bible has to say about knowing Jesus Christ. We want you to know that God loves you. The Bible says in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. If you've never believed on Christ to save you, we want to provide that opportunity. And we're going to invite you as we stand and sing in just a minute. We're going to invite you to stand forward and say, I want to get this settled. We've been watching a lot of baptisms over the last few weeks of people that have been in church for many years. And over the last few weeks, they've said, you know, I've been in church all these years, but I've not really followed Christ in the obedience and his command of getting baptized. And I want to get that settled. Amen. We're having people come forward saying, I want to get this settled. And if that's you today, why not... Why don't you today say, I want to follow Christ fully as Lord, and I'm going to get this settled as well. We'll rejoice in that. If you want to join our church fellowship and be a part of what God's doing here, uh, we'll walk you through what it means to be a member and why you should become one, but this is a very appropriate time if that's you as well. Let's stand, and as Rick leads us in our closing hymn, let's respond if God has spoken to you.